I just remember being really excited, like this is actually happening, like we're actually gonna get in the fucking van and do it. We started touring with just a sampler. We had an Equal Vision sampler that had one song on it, which was Delirium Trigger. It all seems like kind of a blur now, but man, we hit the road like making up for lost time. I think that was one of the most insane tours we ever did because it was like kids, you know, just jumping on the road, seeing what it's like, you know? No dough in our pockets, let's just go and see what we, uh, see what we can get. You know, it could be 10 people at the show, 20 people at the show. It was really exciting. I, for one, thought that how it worked is you get a record deal and then you go on tour and you make money you're paid. You know what I mean? I knew nothing about climbing in a van, sleeping, you know, underneath the van if it's too hot out at night. And, you know, we that's what we did. Once this is how we slept, you know, every night, just sitting up in van benches. It wasn't just overnight. I mean, they really started at the beginning and worked their way up. I think we owe our career to all that work we did back then. I mean, I've seen so many bands come and go because they might have a hot single real quick on, on TV or might get on the right tour where they have a little bit of a buzz. But, you know, we played, we just kept coming back. record had just come out and they would play a show and even if it was like 50 people they would call us after the show and they're like you know there's only like 50 people there but we sold like 45 CDs and we were like and they're like is that good and I and I was like yeah that's good that doesn't happen if you're selling a CD to almost every person that's there something magical is happening <laughs> Well, Equal Vision um, introduced us to Nick Storch, who I, th who I think they, they had a relationship with through a few other bands. And that, that transition seemed very smooth. It kind of happened really, really quickly, where we just took the band on and we ran with it. I worked with other bands, but none of them really had the rise, the quick rise that those guys did. I think people's jaws hit the floor, like, what the fuck is happening? This band blowing people's minds, this kid can play guitar. I think I was in shock too, I was like, wow, I, you know, I just started being an agent, this band's happening. What am I gonna do? It was scary. Just had to get in there and grow with them and fight for them every step of them. I mean, it was back when bands could tour 300 days a year and, you know, that would work. We learned a lot from him. He was one of the guys that I used to call every day. They worked constantly. They never said no. It would, I'd call Mike, hey Mike, you wanna do this? Yep, we'll do it. Well, it's a 10 hour drive, we don't care, we'll do it. Hellfest definitely is a, you know, is a funny experience because I think, you know, the stages were, were very close, and I think there was a huge canopy, so sound was bouncing off of everywhere. And, and while we were playing, Hope Conspiracy was playing. So, and I almost felt like, I almost felt like, I could hear Hope Conspiracy more than I could hear me. <laughs> and we stuck out like a sore thumb. We got this weird music. We got this singer who sings, you know, really high. And we're gonna try and push it to these kids who have been, you know, going to hardcore shows. But it worked. The hardcore kids are like, these guys can rip. They play really well. Okay, we'll do it. There's this energy and the stage wasn't even packed. The people that watched them knew this was probably the last time they'd see them this close up and really, you know, be this, hear them at this infantile stage. It's almost like we were proving people wrong, all these people that, you know, really, Coheed and Cambria, really? You know, and now nah, people were digging us. We still brought something that, that fit. Like, oh my God, maybe we're, we're doing something right. People started seeing the other side of what we do um, and how it could fit. We still kind of had our own thing. But eventually the songs kind of what, what drove the whole train. I mean, I consider Equal Vision a hardcore label. And for some what, alternative to get into like this kind of thing is you know is really exciting because it's a little you know it's definitely not going down the center it's pretty left to center both content wise and and musically 
and they just happen to be the one that pulls it off. It had started to progress to the point where we needed somebody to be helping us and really lead us in, in the right direction. We had started getting some phone calls from managers um, that seemed interested, and we met with a few. You know, how do you know how to pick a guy who's going to manage your, your life? <laughs> That was pretty cool. I think it's like, who's soccer who are you singing now? Wow, you just went right the room. But I had, I had started talking to Blaze on the telephone. I almost kind of knew him before I met him. So, you know, same kind of vibe. The dude just uh, was on the same page with us. I remember this one kid in particular talking about them on the Sparta message boards and uh, how awesome that there's this the best band in like so long and all this stuff. So I was reading those message boards and I started listening to them and I got, got their record and I listened to it. And actually, I was some friends of mine that were A&R, oh, were looking for new bands and I was saying, hey, you should check out this band. I'm not particularly, it, the first couple of times I listened to it, I'm like, I'm not sure I get it, but, but you should check this out because the kids are kind of going nuts for it. But then I started listening to the record more and more and I started liking it. That was kind of the, the kicker was seeing them live. It was like, wow, these guys are awesome. They're just different. We called him one day when he was on his way to London. He was going out for another band that he was working with. And right before he got on his flight, we had told him that we wanted him as our manager. He came back a couple of days later and he received a shitload of emails and texts saying, sorry about the band, not gonna happen, blah, blah, blah. We had been touring for like a year and a half straight. We had never done that. We were kids, a lot of us, you know, were having issues with how to figure out how to deal with things, you know? All of us were. Things were moving so quick, maybe there wasn't time to be like, hey man, why did you do this? That pissed me off, so you hold on to that. And I think it just came to a head. And that's when we, you know, my, my aunt got involved. You know, my aunt was a social worker. And this is my aunt Tony, actually. Acted as mediator, uh, a therapist, and things like that. And and, and so I just, I just kind of wanted to communicate to the guys just kind of how I felt and, and just kind of resolve it. I mean, here we were doing our dream and, and I didn't want to throw it away. I remember it being like a definitive moment for us. And I remember walking out of there and we went and all, I think we like had some food or something and we were friends again and it was great, it was cool. Uh, I was a big fan of the band, like when I heard Second Stage, they opened up for a band that I was tour managing called River City High. Their agent didn't want to take out Coheed and they were opening first of four. And me and the singer James were like, dude, this band's fucking awesome, like, let's bring them out. The last show of the tour, 350 people came in uh, Virginia Beach, Virginia, and 343 left after Kohi played. Oh, fuck. Writer's block.